Listener Production. I'm automotive commentator and journalist Greg Rust, and this is Rusty's Garage. Today I'm at Sydney Dragway, where the North Shore Sporting Car Club is gearing up for another evening rally sprint. These events have become very popular in recent years, with a wide array of modern and classics in the car park, ready to race the clock on the tarmac under lights. Helping to set up the course is a driver with a wealth of experience, both locally and internationally. He is the epitome of the Aussie battler, and if it wasn't for his distinctive Mark I escort, you might know Bruce Garland was in the house. Well, his infectious cheeky laugh would be another giveaway. The escort, as you'll hear, has some cool mods. The body is covered in a mural painted by a well-known graffiti artist with a massive following. The colour scheme is as loud as the engine, I can promise you. Garland has ticked some very impressive boxes in a career that spans more than 40 years. Multiple winner of the Australasian Safari, round Australia trial winner, and he's conquered Dakar in a car prepped by a small band of loyal engineers and friends from Sydney. He was pretty hands-on in the build too. From rallying to close friendships with some of the greats. We talk about Brock and back-breaking accidents. The obsession, and I promise you it's an obsession, began with some paddock bashing in Queensland as a young fella. Twelve or thirteen, we used to go and um, out the back of the Gold Coast where we lived at Palm Beach and people used to dump their cars and take the battery out of them so we'd find an old battery and get them in there and push start them and they had no brakes and they were rusted to the shit out. So <laughs> we weren't really... We launched them a fair bit and we did weird things. If we get to it now, you'd go, probably get arrested or the docks would come and take you. But we used to take the boot off and tow it behind the car <laughs> in long grass and you'd be hitting stumps and rocks. And but FJ bonnets were the best. Uh, they got a lot of FCs and FB Holdens. That's what we used to use. A fair bit of them. And they, um, they're all collector's items now. But, yeah, we used to launch the things into trees and, I don't know, no one ever got hurt, which... Uh, I suppose had no brakes, so and if you stalled it, and when the battery was knackered, you get absolutely abused by all the other boys because it, it went with a full car load. And some of them that weren't in the group, they'd come and pay, and then we'd use their money to buy the fuel. And it was a Jerry. We used Dad's mower can to go and get the fuel. It was forty cents for, <laughs> for a gallon of fuel. And uh, he used to, the kids would come that had money. We didn't have any money. And you'd go, yeah, you've got to, got to give us 20 cents for a ride. <laughs> <laughs> Went into the fuel and then we'd drive around and hit things. And yeah, it was it was great fun. It was good, especially when it rained. It was bloody hilarious. But um, yeah, we went through a few of those things. And then, yeah, I was pretty lucky with that. And then I got, got apprenticeship when I was in grade 10, after grade 10, yeah. So I think you told me, was well, your dad was in sort of show business and things like that, is that right? And so, so motorsport wasn't necessarily in the family. What was the, the the moment where you saw something, maybe you spectated somewhere and went, how good is this? Yeah, I can remember it exactly. The My dad was, he he, he ran the, mu- the sound and music part of the um, playroom on the Gold Coast, which was probably the biggest night c- club in Queensland at the time and um, other venues and he, he was right into electronics and music and that sort of stuff and I really wasn't but then I was got an apprenticeship and my, one of the do- blokes I was apprenticed to in the workshop he was a rally driver, his name's Dennis Brown and he had an XU1 and um, he took me for a, a Lutwich rally which was a round of the Australian Rally Championship and it was in the car park, they had like a uh, stage in the car park and I just couldn't believe these cars are going sideways and tearing rubber off and the coppers standing there just watching them and didn't even book them so <laughs> I, that's the best thing to do let's hang on and do a rally driver <laughs> so that's how it started I got the bug there and uh yeah yes yeah, so we're still good mates Dennis I, I got him a job on running the workshop on Mad Max uh 
So we still talk to each other. Yeah, there's a bit of competition between us still now. Look, look, we're fast forwarding here because there's a lot of ground to cover in your your life and time and your career. Mad Max. People will their ears will have pricked up hearing about that. What did you do for the film? I did a couple of jobs. Uh, originally, they were going to film it out at um, uh, Broken Hill, up, up in the Monday Monday plane, but it wouldn't stop raining for two years. They even looked at using defoliant to to uh, make it look like a desert again, but it just wouldn't. <laughs> so they had to pick the whole lot up and take it into Nibia. The problem with that is all the cars that they'd slapped together, and there was hun- uh, there was nearly a hundred cars. There's amazing amount of cars and bikes and everything. Well, they're having trouble with the cars overheating in the sand over there. And um, I'd met the head of the stunts and he rang me one day and I was at the strippers down at bloody, uh, the pub. And I, the blind wasn't good and I had a few beers and I go, oh, he's go, we've got all these problems. And I said, mate, oh, hang on, the, the, the music's a go on the strip. Oh, yeah, I'll go outside. Anyway, he was in Nanibi. I didn't even know where the hell that was. And uh, I had to go and look it up when I went home. And I said, well, he's coming back on Monday. So anyway, there was a whole list of problems they were having with the fuel and overheating and because I'd done all the Dakar stuff and they knew that I'd done a lot of that, that you know, uh, that work in that that sort of environment so and they're having trouble in the workshop and so they flew me over I had two weeks we're getting ready for started the year to get ready for Dakar and I had two weeks we were waiting for a budget and some parts and so I said look I can give you two weeks to come and help sort out so I went over helped them they they were pretty close but they just they just needed a couple of different things with fans and electric water pumps and stuff like that and changing to um, av gas instead of the local fuel and, and it got them a track they thought they were they were blowing engines up and doing all sorts of and then I also had an offer for a drive so I went over and drove one of the cars or a couple of the cars in the stunt but you see me for about the car I was in for about point one of a second <laughs> were you all dressed up made up oh yeah but I it was crazy I was got to get Ed shaved and my arms are shaved and make up every day and then drive the car and and then then I got I got they got paid in crazy amount of money uh, per day, uh, and then I, I got involved when you're next to the stunt. So I didn't. They had young do proper stunt drivers to do the crashes, and I think look, they got a bonus if they did a proper big crash. I think they got five grand or something extra on top of their pay, and the pay was was sensational. And then I, after the first week, I did the one scene. There was I was right next to a crash, and I had to avoid uh, this car rolling over and. Uh, it was pretty straightforward, but I got seven hundred dollars extra, and I'm like, "What's that for? That danger money?" They said, "That's for danger money." I go, "What? What danger? What? What fucking danger?" I gone. If I got paid every time I did something dangerous in a rally, yeah, I'd be a multi multi millionaire. <laughs> I wouldn't believe it. Every time we did something dangerous, more dangerous than normal, uh, I got extra money. Yeah, it was uh, it was crazy, but it was a really good experience. Some lovely people working on that movie. It was it was really talented people, and um, it was a joy. It was long. We did long days, and and a lot of sitting around, and and, and seven days a week. Some of us shooting, you know, and it was. I think they were spending half a million dollars a day on the shoot, and and I got there. I, I left on day 125 or something, <laughs> so to go to to get ready to go to Dakar. So it was when the car was getting shipped to um, England to get on the boat to go to Peru, and then I had a I, I was over there for about six or seven weeks. So it was a it was a, a really good experience. Amazing, so one of many great driving experiences that you've had um, mm. during your career. In in a competitive sense, you've had wonderfully long relationships with with some of the well-known Japanese brands as well but we probably should start with your first car was actually and it's sad to think that they're gone now the first car was a Holden is that right yeah it was a HD Holden Premier and it was my pride and joy and I was I had no money I was an apprentice mechanic and um and I did a lot everything I changed car with engines and, and all that sort of stuff that you do in that age and then I got into rallying and then that's all I had so I it was my daily driver and we took it in a rally <laughs> And the first stage we did was just north of Mackay and I went over the grid and it landed that hard that the engine broke, mounts broke and the engine fell over in the engine bay, got stuck on full throttle, the shocks broke on the back and we rolled into the control, not literally, we just <laughs> fell into the control and the th- 
we still got fast as time or something. It was, <laughs> and then, but then the thing wouldn't. It, we spent more time off the road than on it after that. It, it was in the middle of a cyclone hit that night, and it was an all night rally back then. And then I got an escort, so that's when I got a proper car after that. You have one here today, as we're recording this. We're getting ready for a, a rally sprint at, at Eastern Creek. It's a Mark One, and it's worth talking about because it's very unique, Bruce, isn't it? I mean, for a starter, to tell listeners about the engine in it and the paint scheme. Okay, so it's it started off as a project that was going to be a cheap car to just <laughs> muck around, and it got out of control. And then I was doing a bit of rehab when I after my heart operation, and then I was to finish the body off. And, and, and in the end, so it's got a I put. I had a Honda S2000 engine gearbox, but I, I blew it up here a year and a half ago. I dropped the valve at nine grand, and then I, so I went to more, I wanted more torque. So now it's got a K24 with a six-speed sequential out of a one of the Ford old Ford supercar gearboxes, uh, high lux gear. So it's got all the gear on the thing, and it's got the latest Helltech computer and dash in it, and and it, it, it's it's gone way beyond. But there's a lot of joy in driving. It's a fun car, and the paint job on it been done by my nephew. His tag name Soffles, and um, he he's got a bit of a character. <laughs> he he got my sister to bail him out of jail a few times because he got caught painting things that he shouldn't have been. But now he paints buildings, and um, so he's a proper graffiti artist. It's it's he, and he's taken elements of what you wanted and told a story on this Mark One Escort, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. He yeah, I said, look, I want this car. When you look at a Mark One, and especially with the big, I got the big steel arches on it. I said that looks like a chick lying down. So can you just? I want a chick lying down, <laughs> and then uh, I want to, and I want these colours, and then he just. And he's freaking away <laughs> with a spray can and two 12 hour night. We started at, starts at about lunchtime. We went to about midnight and uh, I was with him the whole time pretty much. And yeah, it was pretty amazing to watch him work. And he's, he had it in his head from when he started it. Uh, just put some shadow lines here and there. And then he's just, it was just, it was, it was very unbelievable to watch. He's very talented. He does amazing paintings and very, very, what are we talking in in horsepower terms now? Uh, I think at the fly it's probably got about two hundred and fifty horsepower. It's got one hundred and ninety horsepower at the wheels, and five hundred and fifty newton ma- meters of torque. So, in nine hundred, it weighs nine hundred and fifty kilos. So that power to weight ratio is pretty awesome, and I've got the weight really well balanced in the car. So yeah. when we sit in it, it's 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 probably got more weight on the rear than the front. And the hell the Haltech dash has a nice little message when it's time oh, to shift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you hit the rev limiter, <laughs> just before you hit the rev limiter, a big sign flashes up on the bottom of the dash that says, "Change gear, you fucking idiot." <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So anyway, I told the boys, and then they put it in. I didn't even know they could do that, but they just typed it in. And I'm just going, "Holy shit, that's great!" So, but the problem is, you've got to be in the car when it hits a rev limiter to see it. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. So you're working as a as a mechanic. The motorsport bug bites from a competitive sense, but you would also uh, work around it in your in your job role, wouldn't you? I mean, you'd, you'd get to meet legends like in in the Australian scene, um, from Greg Carr to Colin Bond, and the international scene, Bjorn Valdegard, Ari Vartanen, and more. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty spectacular. And the, yeah, we met. And then we'd, you'd meet Brocky in the round Australia, and Brocky was doing some rallies back then, and then later on end up I had when I had my own team Brocky ended up coming drive for us so that was a bit that was a bit surreal you know for a couple of years there we did a, quite a few events together uh different cars obviously but um yeah it was it was it was quite an amazing journey I worked with Kevy Bartlett for a while and yeah and, and they because you're with those people they're teaching you the right way to do things you know the yes you know, Bondi was really really good teacher he 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 was he talk a lot of good technique and just driving technique, but also how you build the car and how you make a dollar go ten miles far further than it, <laughs> than it should. You know, so you, it, it's easy if you've got heaps of money and heaps of time. Everything's easy, but what's the thing with people don't realise with motorsport is it's always a battle with time and money. You either haven't got any money and plenty of time, or you got 
no time and plenty of money. So it's always an issue of what can you do in a certain time frame with what you've got. And they were really good teachers at those things. And and uh, I work with Bob Riley at Rally Art as a Mitsubishi as well. So there's a lot of connections. Dickie Johnson drove one of my escorts once at the TGA. So over the life, there's been, and, and still say good day to them all. It's all, it's, and I meet them at Leeburn Sprints every year. And yeah, it's, it's a great feeling, you know. One one name we didn't rattle off there was the late Doug Stewart, who who's passed away in recent years. He's been, at one point, a, a boss of the Confederation of Australian Motorsport, and and very significantly with Mitsubishi and, and Rally Art in this country. And you co-drove with him, didn't you? And you you were, you know, you knew him for a long time. Yeah, look, he, he was a great bloke, Doug. He was very fair. He was hard but fair. And um, we did the Condo Seven Hundred and Fifty, which was like a test for the Safari. Uh, I still remember we won it twice and it, we used to go all day in into the night and they were pretty gruelling two day events but on the long stages you'd go the sun light us up a durry will you <laughs> <laughs> so you'd shut the tree we could turn and yeah gate coming up and then you'd get a durry going and pass it over and you'd be having a durry and he was fairly hauling we had a, it was still a quick car I mean the technology now has leaped ahead in brakes and suspension and tyres but for that in that day it was as quick as hell you know mm. and he was driving it he was 60 at the time and yeah he was he was good he was punting it hard but yeah it was and and sitting next to those you sit next to somebody you absorb something i don't i sat the first time i sat next to greg Carr and and i was a, i thought i was a reasonably good rally driver i was, I was absolutely nowhere he, he you just think he's coming down the straight at work cat down at the castro down in testing this is in Can- Canberra yeah and you just go he's going to break now There's, and then when you see Jesus that's when you break well he went way past that <laughs> <laughs> and I just go are you kidding and he just just about on the car just stabbed on it and then the thing's banging and clanging and sideways and, and you just go wow and and I, that's sitting next to him and seeing how you do it I picked up a, just so much from that, being able to do that you know you, we've talked a little bit here about your Mark One Escort now, but mm. what are we? Oh, that was probably would have been a Mark Two or something back then, and they were a magic car, weren't they? In full flight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that was when when Greg and Colin were driving the BDR. They were the cutting edge of, of uh, rallying back in the late seventies, early eighties, up against the Datsuns, and and um, but the Escort was winning everything in the world. I mean, they were lovely to drive, and um, yeah, but they needed quite a lot of loving to keep them going they were, <laughs> but they were, they were pretty highly strung but geez the, the noise they made and you, you take them for a drive we used to take it for a drive sometimes after the rally and they were going to rebuild the engine anyway so didn't, we couldn't do it too much to we, we took it around the block to drive it out one day and I come out and I couldn't even stand up my legs I pulled the trigger and went all the way to 9-8 a couple of gear changes and we got back to the workshop with the other like oh, holy Jesus <laughs> <laughs> that is unbelievable so yeah look it's it's uh, yeah I just remember that but anyway it's, 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 there's a lot of history there the, the point we should probably wrap up on Doug too is that uh, sadly when he passed there was a number of special cars around his place and you have either acquired some of those back or made sure they've gone to good homes yeah that tried right. one of his sons rang me and there's they had a property up at hill end and they said oh look we, there's your old car there's a, your old fink car which was our old safari car that i used to share with rod jones because we were we were in the race but we were the backup mechanic so we had all the tools and the spare heads and turbos and alternators everything in the back and it, but we had the same engine as they did so we went pretty hard but we we didn't have any good brakes because it weighed so much more but anyway that car was still up there and it um they'd been using it on the farm it had like a, a foot of bird shit all over it and uh i drank i said oh anyway so I, I, we did a bit of a deal and then i said what are you doing the other cars and there was a, and doug had just drive a car because that was dug and then it had stopped and that where it st- stood there for 30 years so i got them i got them all out there because the property was going anyway and if i didn't take them then I, they might have gone to scrap so i took all the, the we rescued some that were down in ravines and and um yeah so it was great you know we got them going and then they're, they're, they're all one of them they're all got jobs now people are restoring them whatever They say that by 2035, all new cars will be electric, so there is still plenty of years ahead to rev it to the limiter. I mean, that's what 13B rotaries are for, right? 
did you get your license first go? I did actually. I think it was the day after I was 17. Back in the day, you had to, you had to go with your birth certificate and you I couldn't get there. The mom of her birthday, it was the next day. So I didn't have it long. You didn't? <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell me that story. Oh, I think it was Tom Frewlery speeding <laughs> and doing burnouts or wheelies or something. And that's when I realised that rallying was the don't do that on the road. Hmm. Uh, you still enjoy your circle work and fun things now, and that might happen on, on the property or whatever, but but clearly that's a great message for people. Road's not a racetrack, great place to come and do it, to learn car skills like that or bikes if you're into that. Go and do it on a racetrack or, or at, a, at, a, at a venue like we are now for a rally sprint. Yeah, or in the paddocks yeah. where there's no other people around, you know. that That's the best, best thing is actually the paddocks when, when we're little to getting car control and everything. But, yeah, we're doing just... just Late teens being stupid, um, but I ain't. As soon as I lost, I just and then when you haven't got a license for three months, you, <laughs> you're seeing got to walk everywhere. You go, I'm not going to do that again. again. So yeah, no, that was the same sort of time when I started doing rallying. Was got hooked on the rallying, and then I went. I just do it. Once you do that, you don't need to do that other shit. Mm. You know. What, what was the moment for you where you thought? You know, clearly when you're younger, you are people get obsessed by it. it. Might be football, it might be whatever. For us, it's it's motor racing and cars and bikes. What was the moment where you thought I, I want to make driving or, or professional motorsport my occupation? You're working around it in a in a mechanic sense. You're working around you know good teams and cars and things. But what was the light bulb moment for you where you thought I can do this? Uh, that, yeah, I think it just sort of crept up over a few years. I think being around it, and we didn't have the resources, and there was, we came, you know, we we struggled as a family. Uh, you know, we didn't have any money, and and and, and you know, there was, so we came. There was five, you know, there was five of us in the family. So as we come, we were struggling to get food when we were little, you know. So I everything I had to do, I had to do myself and try and. Because we wasn't going to get any finance, we didn't have the ability. I'm sure if we had the financial mum would have given help, but I did everything, and then it, it also that teaches you a lot too. You don't if you, if you can't afford it, then you don't do it. But mm. and you've got to work hard to get it. And then I think with me get Dougie when the safari started coming along, and then that was a professional team, you know, and get actually. We got paid a thousand dollars or something to drive, but, and where normally you're just pouring money out of your pocket. And I went, "This is pretty good. I reckon this would be good to do this all the time." But mm. it wasn't all the time. But it, 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 you know, so it was across between, you know, working on the cars and then and then getting to drive them. And I always had a dream. I thought, "Look, I think I got enough in me to 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 um, speed if I can control it." to be successful mm. and then it just took a while it just it just took a long time for everything to fall into place to be at the right place at the right time and and it's just people you meet i met a i did a did a rally for Mitsubishi in silk road rally in china yep. in 1988 started in Tiananmen square it was six months before the the tanks were there and everything and um he went for th- and i met some japanese that were, were that were running isuzu marketing and then they, I said, oh, you need to come out to the safari. And then they came out and we helped them with that. And then I, that's how I got a drive. So mm-hmm. it's it's sort of having good relationships with people and then building on them when you can and, and helping, you know, and that's how I got the drives started with Isuzu. So. You're a gregarious character. People get a sense of that from the, the podcast chat. Those relationships... Did you have to work at that, or it just sort of seemed to come easy with you because of the, the nature of the person you are? Oh, I think it's just it's just the nature, and I, you know, and there's uh, when you're in that environment, it, those rallying environment and that, an outback environment, and nothing's perfect. You you, you know you, you you got to make things other go. You got to adapt. You, you know, the, this is all different things get thrown at you all the time, and you got to be able to respond to it positive and and and. and and I think that's probably the biggest thing. When things get hard and people are tired, that's when some of their true characters come out. So if yeah. you're still enjoying it and happy when everything's going wrong, and that, I think that's a positive. Yeah. And that's the, probably the reason I kept getting the, the strives and everything for that. So it's, it's, I've only ever known you to have a laugh, right? right? Do you have those moments where you boil over, where you, you, you crack it? Oh, yeah, yeah, look... Especially 
in the preparation, you know, when you know something, if you, so it's like this, if you blindly go, I'm going to drive across the Simpson Desert, I've never done it before. So you, the whole thing you learn as you go. But once you've been across the Simpson Desert and that broke and that fell off and did that and you got bogged and you don't want to do it that way again. Mm. So when you know how it should be done to make it easy to go across the desert, mm. that then you have to, so then you're trying to bring a whole team together to build a car to do that job. You've got to push them outside. They, they, you've got to make them go hard. And sometimes you've got to crack it because sometimes you have to be a bit of a dictator, unfortunately, because you know if you don't, do it to the level that needs to be prepared at, it's going to fail anyway. Yeah. So if you just ignore, you know, that's not good enough and you still go, That's a, to me, that's stupid, you know. The endurance element of the game, Safari, Fink, Dakar, which we'll get to, what, what was so, um, you gravitated to that? What, what, what did you like about that so much? I think, I don't know. Well, the remoteness? Yeah, the yeah, challenge. the remote. When you're in the desert, desert, remote places are beautiful places. Some people get scared, but I like that. You go to a, the desert in the middle of um, Dubai and there's just nothing around. All you can see is sand dunes everywhere. And it could be, it can be a bit daunting, but it's, I, I, it's really a strange place. You know, if you don't do something right, you're going to die mm. really quickly. You know, if you don't take enough water and don't not tell anyone, you, you know, if, if things can go wrong very quickly, you have to respect it. And if you respect it, you'll love it. Mm. If you don't respect it, it'll bite you on the ass big time. So, I don't, it's just that remoteness and then being, it's the freedom. It's like driving a magic. When you're in the car and you're going really fast, on somewhere you've never seen before on a road or or you're going across the sand dunes and you're hauling ass and going and, and and it's just it's just like you're on a magic carpet you know the car's working well you're you're off the ground and you're just floating and you're just and you're just going past these unbelievable scenery of mountain ranges and oases and all sorts of weak old castles and whatever and you just go wow and it's you know it's happening 100 mile an hour and and that's that feeling of freedom and no speed limits and no chimes going off in the dash <laughs> is very hard to replicate in a real life. It's a anywhere in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's 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 a sort of freedom. Yeah, it's just very hard to describe it. But it is like it's. Uh, but when you get it, if it goes wrong, it hurts like shit. You know, yeah. and I've, I've got had it go wrong, big time, a couple of times. Like yeah. you get some wrong and it wins you. You know, you, you land that hard that it you actually get winded. You know, uh, that's pretty normal. But well, yeah, I've had one big crash that hurt, broke my back. But yeah, so but the, getting back to that, uh, the question is, is, it's just it's sort of surreal. It's like a, I don't know, it's like going to a, it's a different like a dimension, really. You know, <laughs> and the real world goes away. You can completely concentrate. And now I got an issue now because I I taught myself over years to concentrate so long like when you're doing five six hours constant yeah. and then you got to back it up again again in the afternoon another three or four hours at full speed and then you got to go to bed and sleep on the ground and in a swag and then get up and do it again and again and again and again you know you you your concentration the ability to concentrate and block everything out goes to another level so my wife will talk if i'm reading something and i'm concentrating i'm blocking everything out and i see it's <laughs> you get in trouble bruce <laughs> I, i'm in trouble a lot mate. I, I don't i don't know how i get through life with doing so many things wrong but i do get into trouble but i can't i just i can't switch it off now it's like once i constantly lock onto something because the problem, because you've not seen the road and you're locking onto, you, you're trying to drive the car as fast as on the edge of what it'll go before you crash. If you just wander off about, oh, what am I going to have for dinner tonight or something, back, you rip the wheel off, you know, you'll get a punch because you just, you can't afford a fraction of a second concentration. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Neil Crompton's got a great line that he sometimes says in commentary about, in circuit racing terms, about buying a ticket to that last hour of a Bathurst mm. or something along those lines. Yeah. Is it is it similar in a Dakar in the sense, or, or, a, or a Fink or a Safari, in that you can't always go 100% 
or is the caliber of the competition, the caliber of the factory machines and so on that turn up, does that does that demand it for days and days and days of you at that level? Yeah, yeah you've got to. You've, it's, yeah, that's a difficult question. But the, the thing is, you've got to pace it. Even you, the dudes that have got the best equipment and they drive, they'll overdrive it, and it'll only take one second. Just a fraction of a some mistake, and then the whole lot will be you're out of the race. Mm. Uh, and, and so it's a balance of going right to that edge and coming back. Mm. And if you can do that and come back off that and win the race, you've done a good job. Mm. So safaris, you know, I was lucky. I, I wasn't lucky. I won five safaris. What would happen is you'd race really hard for, a, a, but a little bit to have a, up your sleeve for four days five days and then you'd see who was got any fight left in them because yeah. some people run out of fight their car's not built properly they they got too much fatigue or they've and, and you get to a point i was talking about before when you get into that zone and crompton's talked about it when you get into the zone even though you're going really fast everything slows down and your your movements are just super relaxed and your breathing and, yeah. you're not breathing and that but the things you're putting the times in because and then you to do that little bit more you might gain on a stage one or two minutes but the risk level goes skyrockets mm. so you can drive at a certain level whatever percentage of how you measure it but you go that little bit more and then you'd start missing the corners and you start going off and and then all of a sudden all of a sudden it's gone and and you don't the gain is not that much mm. but yeah so when you get into that zone it's pretty good your um career uh, it kind of shaped you for this in many ways the learnings that you had as a as a young bloke the stuff you've learned behind the wheel invariably you have to be that adaptable guy or person when something breaks in the middle of nowhere you've got to find solutions you might have some things with you that'll help repair it but have there been some real bush mechanic moments where you've managed to get something over the line that that soon yeah we've oh, there's a couple <laughs> there's so many of them i remember one safari i drove and i jumped over the gas line between um uh, moomba and down to port augusta yeah. And then when the car landed, it was in four-wheel drive and jumped out of four-wheel drive. We couldn't get it in high range anymore. So we drove in low range for 650 kilometres. Oh. So that second gear, imagine getting in a car, put your car in second gear and drive from Sydney to Coffs Harbour. <laughs> it's very slow. But in the stages, we weren't too slow. And, and, and I drove it, it was right on the rev. It was revving, it's not revving its tits off all day. I thought the wing was going to blow it. We lost an hour and 15 minutes, uh, 20 minutes to the leader, and we lost the race by five minutes. Unbelievable. So that was that was come come back from like 15th or something. So never, never give up. Never, ever give up. If it's moving and it can go, keep forward, going forward. And another one that happened that when we had, we were leading the rally, we had about a 26-minute lead. So I was cruising a little bit, and we were first car on the road that hadn't been driven on for 40 years up in the Northern Territory, and there was a termite mound in everywhere, those big termite mounds, and there was one, and it hit this, it was in the long grass, and it hit right in the wrong spot of the steering shaft, that was one of the tie rod ends, yeah. and bent it. And I go, oh, that's not good. And then we hit another rut, and it broke it. We normally carry a spare, because it's happened before, normally carry a spare in the, in the car, but we'd washed the car and done a, a show with it beforehand mm. and we forgot to put it back in oh. so I thought oh Brocky's coming we'll get it off Brocky yep. so Brocky was he was 10 minutes behind us so we pulled him up he, he, he hasn't got one either boys haven't put it in it's all you know, it's my fault in the end of the day we didn't check it it should have been on the checklist so anyway so we go shit shit what are we going to do so we got spanners we got two spanners and zip ties and wire and we strapped the splintered the thing <laughs> and we drove it 80k to go and then another transport and then another 110k stage through crocodile infested creeks and it said this is the roughest stage of the rally <laughs> and we're going holy shit that so we got it we got out of the stage we lost seven minutes i think by the time we patched it up Unreal. so we lost seven minutes so we've got now we've got 19 minutes left 
but it's a fairly fa fast transport, so we're belting along it. It's in Northern Territory, there's no speed limit, so we're still doing, with the strapped up steering, we're doing like 130, and then the, she'd get a bit wobbly, and you feel it, the <laughs> zip ties would start breaking, and the wheel would turn left, and the way she'd we'd spear off into the bush, and we'd get out, and we'd do it again, and then we're running out of zip tie, and we're trying to look on the map to see if there's an old, there's a farm somewhere that we could go and get a welder. So we're looking, we're looking at for some of the cars that, that have been rolled and, burned upside down and we want to oh, I think if we get a HQ old and I reckon I can make that one fit <laughs> so we're driving looking at all these old cars and we're slowly we're going along we're going along and then finally it, it um, she let go and it, we had no more zip ties left and we race taped we taped it all up and we still got about 30k to go to the thing you know, and we're wasting and we're going oh, we're out of the rally there's going to be no way we're going to finish this stage and I, unless we can weld it up or get another one and you wouldn't believe it, coming down the road was a jackery the same as ours. No way. No, you're true, <laughs> with the policeman and his wife and two kids in the back. So I've, we flagged them out. I got my silver driving suit. I'm right at it. Stop, stop. What, what? Can we help? And I said, yeah, can I buy your tie rod in? And I'm looking and I'm going, they're not going to. So you're going to leave them stranded potentially? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm going, they're not going to do this for 10 bucks. <laughs> So and I've worked out, I'm doing quick calculations. I've already spent two hundred and fifty thousand to get here. And I said, We're looking at it. I'll give you a thousand dollars for it. They didn't even know what it was. And they get uh, okay, so I pulled over. I cut it off in about two minutes, and then I we put <laughs> it on our car, and we've gone. Well, we haven't got the money here, but if you come to the bivouac tonight, <laughs> I've got thousand bucks for it. And then we've just left it. <laughs> I'm going, oh shit! Okay, thanks here. Boom, boom, and off we went because we we're in a hurry. And then we did the stage, and then the other two dudes they thought we were out of the rally, so they're now arguing who's in first. I'm winning. Your no, your second. So they they'd given up trying to win, but now they're gonna they're gonna fight each other now because I'm not in the race anymore. But as I'm, they're just about to leave. There's a bit of a delay at that control. I've come screaming into the control, and you should the look on their faces. They just their jaw drop because I've come back from the basically from the dead. <laughs> anyway, they both hydraulic because they, they both wrecked their cars in the stage in the creek crossing where the crocodiles they shit themselves and they hydraulic their engines. And then we we just sailed through. I said, oh, I'm just going to drive through this stage. We didn't even race. I said, we got out of jail already. And then I gone. I got the message. So to go back to the. So I got the tie rod, and I'm going to go back to put it back on the car, but it's 350k <laughs> back down the highway and back into the bush. But it's Northern Territory, so it's no speed limit. Yeah. So I filled the, our service jackery, and I'd made, I made—I did. It wasn't a smart thing to do. I got because I got the message. He's worried about that his car's going to get burned or stripped or something. But his wife and kids had already been taken out by another policeman, so they weren't stranded out there. Yeah. So I've got the tie rod. I've taken it back off, so I can put it back on his car and at the meantime he's going he's come up with his wife to have dinner with Brocky and get his <laughs> thousand bucks and I've passed him at Warp Factor going the other way and didn't realise that and I had no way to contact him because we didn't have phones or anything back then this is 2,000 phones that worked out there so I drove all oh, I found his car put it back on come back and because I was doing like a million mile an hour I've run out of fuel and, and it's like Two o'clock in the morning, the race starts again at six, and I haven't even come back. I'm going, shit, took me into trouble here. So, anyway, I flagged down some officials that were in the rally, and they had 20 litres, and I got back, and then I met him on the way back, and they had a, they were fine. They had a, they had a nice dinner with Brocky, and because um, we had our own chef at that time, yeah. and um, and I gave, they wouldn't take the thousand dollars. I said, look, take the thousand dollars to, just go and buy something for you. Know, what did your wife buy some? clothes or dress or whatever yeah. I, you've saved me yeah. <laughs> I didn't tell him I'd already, you just saved me $250,000 <laughs> anyway so we ended up winning the rally it was nice. uh, yeah but because we didn't give up and we just kept going things change and we, that taught us a lot that was in 2000 that taught us a lot you, as long as you can keep moving just, just keep moving it mm. doesn't matter if it's a race just in life just if you sit there nothing will happen yeah. you've got to move and do something so we just and that's we just kept going and going, and then we end up getting a deal. We put a deal together to go to Dakar by just keep going, you know. We'll get to Dakar because you brought up Brock. Yeah. People love a Brock story on, on the podcast. What was he like to, to be around in that environment? And we tend to think of him 
I mean, he was such a diversely successful driver anyway, but we tend to think of him, for, you know, from a Bathurst point of view or a touring mm. car point of view, but he, he had this sort of deft touch in all machines, didn't he? Yeah, look, he, he was... Um he was it was he, he was special he, and but he was just a good character and then with he was with the team the boys didn't they not knew I was Brocky but he just they used to put bungers under his chair and <laughs> shit like that <laughs> they just treated him like one of the boys <laughs> you know he was looking for booby traps all the time because they were <laughs> pulling pranks on him like they pulled on everyone so yeah he I think he really enjoyed, he loved the safari those long distance and. Uh, you know, he did one, two or three with us, three or four. Yeah, and he did a few, did around Australia, and um, and got really. And he, you know, the with the the thing, the thing with Pete was, I think, personally, I think, what what made him so good is in the end is what what killed him because he would wanted to just he'd go like we were supposed to drive the standard car, sign some autograph. He was retired and he was, you know, just have a good time and, and do a lot of PR and, and stuff like that. But as soon as he got a sniff of the lead, it just, something switched in him and he'd, he did it around Australia. He was trying to beat, I was miles in front of him. I was 20 minutes in front and he was trying to catch me. It was the last day and he rolled the car. I said, what did you do that for? It didn't make any sense. Mm. I said, is, is, unless I break down, you're not. You're never going to catch me, and 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 he'd do that. He'd just go. He'd, and I passed him once in the safari. I mean, he he was in a different car. I was in my car's a lot more in a different class, yeah. and I he got the shits because I because I overtook him and then he hit a tree. <laughs> I'm going, well, you should have just slowed down. I try overtook you, but anyway. But he yeah he he switched. He was like doing that signing autographs and just having a cool time but as soon as he could sniff that he could win mm. he, that switch just he just changed and that's i think that's what happened in the um you know in the ta- in the targa over there he, he got he was he got second on the first stage or whatever and then he and he hadn't done the recce right and there was a lot of other things that caused it but it was that competitiveness that he that he that would switch on and and that's what that's what i reckon anyway the end of part one of my chat with larrikin off-roader Bruce Garland. Some great personal insights there into his time with Peter Brock. Make sure that you head back to the Garage Library and fire up part two. It's there, ready to go right now. There's more good laughs, including some Aussie ingenuity to cope with long stints at the wheel when you need a bathroom break, but you just can't lose those precious seconds. Plus, the Dakar crash that almost left him in a wheelchair. And why he's a big believer in doing it now. Don't put off that resto project or the dream to go racing a moment longer. Listener.